Michael, aka Bitcoin hey. Rabbi, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, uh, thanks for having wow. me on. I'm great. Dude, look, thanks for coming on. I've been messing you around with this for ages. We've been meaning to do this for quite some time. I'm so sorry, but we've got here finally. Uh, when did I last see? It wasn't Crypto Springs, was it? It was, I think, uh, 2019 Crypto Springs, so just about two years now. Damn, that's that's incredible. So much has happened. So little's happened as well. I well, wasn't listen. able to, yeah, I mean, everything. I wasn't able to make it to Miami this year, but uh, the, you know, Oh, I'm sure we will catch each other the next one. Are you going to be in Texas? Uh, for Bitbox Bloom? Yeah. Do you know what? I think I will be. But my problem is, is I need to be in Boston on the 28th. I think it starts on the 26th. So, and I'm in, I've got to go to El Salvador first. So, yeah, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to come in for like two or three days. Uh, I will make a day of the conference. I'll probably have my kids with me, but that's cool. I want them to see it all. So if you're there, I will see you, brother. Awesome. We can That's talk. Great. We'll catch up. Well, listen, look, this is a really important topic. The show we're making today, in some ways, is the one I want to put in front of my children. I don't want to, I'm not saying let's make it as a kid's show, but I want them to hear about this and hear about what you're doing and why and the challenges. But then also for everyone else, I got this really interesting email the other day. I just did an interview with Dylan Leclerc, who's a 20-year-old, works for Bitcoin magazine, dropped out of uni. And you know what? He gets Bitcoin better than me. He is very, very smart. And I got this email that came through and somebody said, Pete, you probably don't realize that's one of the most important shows you've made because that's the type of show that can go out to other 20-year-olds. Uh, that shows that shows how a 20-year-old doesn't have to go down the traditional uni route and they can go out and learn on their own. And also from this, they probably relate to it more than you. And I th thought that was a great point. I don't know if you've checked it out. I haven't heard that from him, but I have... Uh... I, I think I read his piece and I've I've spoken to him before. Yeah, he's smart, dude. But the reason we're making this show is it's a funny story, right? I get this uh, teacher in South Korea write to me. She said, I've got a kid here working on a project about cryptocurrencies. She was wondering if she could have some of your time. She's got some questions. And like I get a lot of inquiries, but I thought, you know what, let's, let's just do this. So this kid comes on and she's 11 years old, right? And I'm fully expecting to have the most basic chat ever. And then she goes into all this detail. She's like asking me about MMT. She's asking me about Bitcoin, the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I was thinking, hold on a second. My kids aren't studying this stuff at 11. I mean, it turns out she's at this great school. So I went away from that kind of like really inspired thinking this is really cool. And funny enough, my daughter actually today asked me to learn more about Bitcoin, which I'll come to as well. But I was starting to think about, you know what, I have not done enough work in understanding your work. I know your book. I have a copy here. Um, but I haven't done enough work understanding the importance of teaching kids about Bitcoin and, and also getting my own mental models in pr place. But you have done this. Probably you've probably attacked this more more than anyone else in the entire space. So I really want to talk to you about it, man. I want to talk about why you did it, everything you've been through, what you've learned. Um, yeah, I'm really fascinated to hear the whole journey. Yeah, well, the thing about uh, kids coming to Bitcoin is that it, most of the people that we interact in this space are either coming from a super technical view or they're involved in like the financial investment space, which both you and I are not from either of those uh, industries. And so the thing is that you can, Bitcoin can be really simple. It can be a, as simple that a, a child can understand it and maybe even understand it better because they don't have to unlearn so much, you know, the, of the of the financial system, the the banking system. Um, you think about, you know, all the stats about like people who are un unbanked and underbanked. I mean, ch even in the richest country in the world, children are, don't have bank accounts. I mean, they can't, they, they have to get from their parents and they can't access all of these services. If you're under 18, even with your parents' permission, you can't sign up for PayPal. You can't sign up for Cash App. You can't sign up for Venmo. Like they, but yet they know about money and they know about digital currency from video games, um, you know, from every interaction that they have is like, you know, with a, a digital, uh, whether like when I was a kid, we were playing, you know, with Mario with coins and things, you know, about digital currency from, you know, when you're a little kid and even more so now, but they don't have any way to deal with it except 
Now with Bitcoin, they can, and they can understand the the finite supply. They can understand uh, that it's uncensorable. I mean, nobody knows censorship like a kid, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so <laughs> they can get a lot of, uh, they can understand uh, some of these basic ideas of what makes Bitcoin useful, valuable, important, and how the 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 way things are now just seem like uh, convoluted and uh, unfair if they're not you know on the receiving end of of the benefits. Yeah, it's really interesting because this is highly relevant at the moment and I, to me, and I've been through it all. So my kids have a uh, bank account each where I put fifty pound a month in since they were born. So I think it works out. So by the time they're eighteen, they'll have about ten thousand pound, which was their go traveling for a year money. I wish I'd put it all in Bitcoin, obviously, for the last 10 years, but uh, whatever. Uh, But they have that, but they can't access that until they're 18. And that is managed by us. They both have money, which they get as gifts from present, uh, from uh, parents and uh, grandparents and uh, brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles. But that is cash that sits in a drawer. Uh, And that's fine. That's usually fine. But when we're out and about, they want things and, you know, they don't, historically have cards so i always pay pay for it and then my son when he was about 14 started to talk about wanting one and there is one company where you can get a um bank account for them but it's like a, you open an account they get a card and i just couldn't be bothered with it but he did it 16 he signed up for a neo bank and got himself a monzo account uh but neither of them you know could as you said get an account when they were younger and then the other point is that you're, you're totally right. I mean, my son understands digital money. He understands FIFA points. He understands earning them. He understands using them, buying things, and you know, limited, essentially scarcity within that. He understands Fortnite dollars, whatever it is in that. Yep, V-Bucks. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that. Yeah, so they understand all that. And then today, it's funny, it was just you know, total coincidence. We're driving into town. We had to go and get some bits. And... Uh, my kids were talking about, because we're going to see my dad. I haven't seen him in ages. I'm like, we should get him a present, I'm talking about stuff like that. And they were saying, oh, you always buy granddad good presents, and oh, we'll have to do that for you when you're older, but you want a Lamborghini. And my daughter was saying, I can't afford that. I said, to be honest, darling, if, if I died, no, sorry, I, be honest, you'll be, you know, you, if you have my Bitcoin, you'll be all right later on. And she was like, well, I get your Bitcoin. I said, well, look, naturally, when I die, half my Bitcoin goes to you and half goes to your brother. She said, well, you need to teach me about Bitcoin, Dad, because like I don't know how to use it. So can can we start? And I was like, that's so funny you should say that because I'm doing an interview today with Michael, a.k.a. the Bitcoin rabbi, that book that I've shown you about because she's got a copy of the book. And uh, so, yeah, so we're going to do this conversation. And then from this, I'm going to make them listen to it. And then uh, I'm going to start their education. Before we start, quick question. Do you have kids? And I don't know if that's a, like an upset question you don't want to answer. <laughs> I have six. Uh, six, thank God. Six. The what? oldest is not. Yeah, I have six kids. The oldest is nine and the youngest is a baby. You have six kids under nine. Are, are you trying to compete with Luke Dasher? Oh, I, I mean, I yeah, the Luke. I think uh, Jimmy Song's got a lot of kids. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, Bitcoiners. I mean, you know, it's a good thing you got to make more Bitcoiners in this world. Dude, you got a little, you got a little <laughs> mini football team there. That's awesome. The right, easiest well, way to make a Bitcoiner is to is to birth one. You know, it's much <laughs> easier than trying to argue them on the internet. You know, could convert them. Uh, I, I don't. Some people like uh, love arguing with gold bugs and boomers and things like that. I just say, you know, let them let them live in peace. And uh, the Bitcoiners, you know, the kids of this day, the the digital generation, they're going to get it because if you talk to the old folks, the main thing they don't get, especially the the people with from an economics like Austrian background, like Peter Schiff, they just don't understand the digital. They don't understand the computer science of it. Um, they you know that it's not physical or whatever. Uh, you know, they they, they could get. It, but that's where the younger generation will just inherently understand it from birth. Uh, you know, little kids, you see, if when they touch a book that's not a touch screen, they kind of scroll on it because they think, you know, a book should should scroll. That's just, <laughs> it's it's in the DNA of kids now. Well, they, they've never known, my kids have never known no internet. <laughs> they've just, it's mm-hmm. always been there. And I sound like that old fuddy when I'm like, well, in my day, we didn't have the internet. Like they've never not known that. They've always known mobile phones and they've always known technology. It's like, it's natural for them. 
I showed my kids, um, the older ones, the video of Steve Jobs presenting the iPhone for the first time. It's a pretty, if you, if you haven't seen it in a while, it's a pretty interesting to go back. It was only like 10, 12 years ago. And to see that original uh, video again from this perspective of how novel and exciting what it was. Because it really, you know, that changed, changed a lot. Didn't he present it as three devices? Yeah, yeah, he exactly. It was a phone. That's- an internet. And it spun, it spun around and then it combined into yeah. a phone, an internet device, and an email communicator or something like that's the, and then it, it joined together. And now what it, now what it's become. Incredible. I'm going to do that after this. I'm going to do it with them. Okay, listen, I'll tell you something quite funny. And it's, I think, I don't know if you've, you've probably had this said to you before, but I think for some adults, a quick skim of your book is also a good starting point. I really do. Oh, it really, I mean, so I wrote it for my oldest daughter when I wrote it was seven. So I kind of had her reading level in mind. She's a very avid reader. Um, so it's meant that children can read it and obviously it's cover- colorful, but it is a, uh, a psyop to get the adults to read it. The, the point is you give it Ooh. to your sister for her children. And really you're trying to get your sister <laughs> to understand Bitcoin. <laughs> because if you're trying to hand somebody, you know, the Seyfedina Moose, the Bitcoin standard, or Andreas Antonopoulos, you know, the internet of, uh, of money, uh, it, somebody with a hundred or 200 or 300 page book, unless they're committed, they're not necessarily going to go into that, but they'll, they'll give a little, uh, you know, a little, uh, comic book, a read. And from, from my book, they'll get, you know, at least the, the basic five main points or so of bitcoin smart i love it well look we should also, let people also know for old just... folks that's what I, I say i have on the back a quote from grandpa you know that's the <laughs> that grandpa it's the first time he could understand bitcoin well it's a layer you should you should start i start with bitcoin money then you should go to the internet of money then you can go to um the bullish case for bitcoin then you can go for the bitcoin standard then you can go to master in bitcoin it's a, it's a tree of books but listen it's a great book we should uh, let's let's tout it out at the start it's called bitcoin money uh, where can people buy it? Just I know I do this at the end, but let's tell them now. Uh, it yeah, is. it's Beautiful on thing. it's on Amazon. If you look up Bitcoin Money or Bitcoin Money Book, it's easy to find there or BitcoinMoneyBook.com. Um, yeah, I mean it's been great. It's been out for uh, two years now, and I I kind of lost track, but we're somewhere in like the twenty thousand copies range. Um, is how, how many we've done. And I'm planning to, we've done, I think, 10 or 12 different languages now. So it's been translated into French, Spanish, Japanese, German, Dutch, um, Portuguese, um, just a, a bunch of different language. People have reached out to me and have wow. requested different languages. So that's been awesome to, to get it into those different markets. And um, I'm hoping to get uh, a hard cop, a hardcover copy this year. That's what I want to, you know, maybe like for the holiday season, hardcover. Somebody wants uh, something a little more sturdy. Because right now it's it's something that's like, you know, it's kind of like a, almost like a pamphlet. It's people mm. order 10 packs or 30 packs and give them out to want their students, um, their, you know, whatever their, I've had um, a investor, uh, somebody who has like a, a small firm buy it for their clients um, or for their employees or something like that. So that, uh, I, you know, when you were at um, Bitcoin is with um, Russell, yeah. Um, and they, they bought, I think they, they got like 50 copies or something to give out or so that's people like Bitcoiners have a natural tendency. They want to, you know, Bitcoin wants to spread. So Bitcoiners mm-hmm. want to share it. So that's, it's, it's something that you can, you know, pass out and, and give out to people that, you know, gets the message out. Well, it, it is a great book. There's a few little Easter egg characters in so, there as well, which is uh, always nice to see. Yeah. Just so, some of our pals, uh, show yeah. up, uh, show up in Bitville. In Bitfield. So listen, look, you read the book. It, it is brilliant. But let's talk a bit about this. Let's talk about educating kids about Bitcoin. So when you approached the book, did, you know, you said you, I mean, you said you wrote it for your seven-year-old. Did she become a testing bed for it? Was that how it worked? Was that what your approach? You would write a chapter, test it on her? Did you test different models on her? How did you do it? What was your approach? Well, the... No, I wrote the whole thing in one sitting. It's just, okay. I mean, if you if you count the words, it's really like an essay. It's about a thousand words. So I just, um, I think I 
like was lying in bed and the the idea of the book came and then I woke up the next morning and just wrote it all out in, in one uh, sitting. Um, really, my wife is a graphic designer, so she, you know, took what was an essay and turned it into a book. Um, oh, wow. You know, she's, she's, yeah, she's worked in publishing books uh, before and that's one of the things that she does. Um, so, you know, I, I did, after it was written, go through it and clarify sentences and make things understandable, make sure that the vocabulary was um, age appropriate and the sentence structure. But it's, it's a, one, it's based off of the structure, a lot of, um, of uh, Saifedean's book. And oddly enough, I see you have Peter Schiff behind you. It is uh, strongly uh, influenced by a book that Peter Schiff wrote um, called How an Economy Grows and Why, or Why an Economy Grows and How It Crashes, which is based off of a comic book that his father wrote. And so, uh, it, I had, you know, influences and, and also, um, Nick Szabo, Nick Szabo's writings. So, you know, I had influences for the, for how the structure came about. Um, but I share it with, I'm a middle school teacher. That's like my day job. And well, so I go. share it with, yeah, so I share uh, Bitcoin. I give classes to you know the the teenagers and preteens, um, as well as to I speak at uh, synagogues and like Jewish groups and youth groups uh, to you know give my give my pitch or my explanation, and uh, you know I connect it with Judaism because I'm I'm a rabbi, so you know yeah. I I want to give both of those perspectives. So I've been you know trying to educate people of all ages, and then. Um, when people want to hear more about it, like they then kind of they'll get into the more technical details and stuff. And then I'm like really helping out. So that that's pretty much what I do. I mean, Bitcoin isn't my day job, but I just in different ways for different ages and different levels, try to assist people and, and explain it to them. And is that a, a Jewish school you teach in? Yes. Yeah. It's a, a small Jewish private school that I've been teaching for past 10 years. So I've got a few questions on that as well. I was going to save it to the end, but we might as well do it now as you've touched on it. And you're you're an Orthodox Jew, right? Is that yes. is that the correct way of saying it? Is there any? I never uh, that's, know. I yeah, always... that, so that is correct. I'm Orthodox. Um, uh, maybe more in within Orthodox, more specifically a Hasidic Jew. Um, you okay. know that I have a, a a a beard and I wear like a coat and hat and um, but yeah, generally uh, Orthodox is the correct term. No, but do you say Orthodox Jew or do you say Orthodox Jewish? I don't really know. Yeah, or um, Orthodox Jew is is correct. That's, that's okay. accurate. So if you're in a uh, private Jewish school, do these schools, they obviously have a different curriculum to standard schools. The Obviously, some of the, the work will be, I guess, teaching of certain things specific to uh, being an Orthodox Jew. Yeah, so we split up our schedule. So in generally what it is is in the morning before lunch is um, Jewish subjects. So uh, Bible class, uh, Jewish law, um, philosophy, theology, um, history, uh, Hebrew language, those kind of classes uh, in the morning. And then we do the um, secular English subjects in the afternoon. So all the all the standard stuff, English um, English reading, writing, math, um, science, you know, all, all of those things as well. Um, and I actually, there was a teacher shortage this year, um, because a lot of schools were out of session in this. So usually I only teach Jewish subject uh, subjects, but this year I was filling in. Uh, so I was also the math teacher, the middle school math teacher. Uh, nice. so like had double the, uh, this, this past year I had double the, uh, the teaching schedule and the responsibilities of what I usually would, which is usually Whoa. just at like a half day. What age, what age uh, math were you teaching? Um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So that's ages 11 to 14. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so listen, I hadn't touched math in years. And I was pretty good at math. It was one subject I was okay at, right? And obviously, we went through a lockdown, and my teacher was working uh, – my uh, the teachers working from home, the kids were from home. But you had to chip in a bit, get the yell from downstairs, can you come and help me? And so, like, so this is my 11-year-old, right? She's like, you help me with math? And I'm going down thinking, yeah, I got this. Let's go. And then we sat down, and I can't remember what she was teaching me. I was like, what the, what the fuck is this? I, I had no memory. <laughs> so I was having to go online to figure it out. So did did you have to, like, scratch up on your uh, math skills? 
Yeah, uh, I mean, a little bit. I also, you know, the, I volunteered to do it because I, I also pre- did pretty well in uh, in math. And uh, But there are some things, ch- uh, they change the way that they teach them, you know, from when you and I were in school, you know, before the turn of the century. But uh, it, a lot of it's pretty similar. Um, uh, just a few things I had to, you know, things that you don't use. Um, like, I just, I just needed to be reminded of, of a few rules of how things work, but yeah, it came, it, w- it worked out pretty well. It was a, we were in school this whole year, um, you know, from, from, so we, we, there were last uh, year, like from April, March or something of last year, we were off the last couple months, but starting September till the end of the school year, we were all in person, um, you know, in our school. So that's, uh, you just had to, had to make it work. I, it wasn't the only, uh, thing that we had to work around of, of, you know, taking on extra classes. And with regards to teaching Bitcoin within the school, do, I, I mean, I don't know the structure of you have a headmaster or a vice, but did you have to go to them and say, look, listen, I'm down this Bitcoin rabbit hole. I want to teach the uh, kids about this. How do you feel about this? Like, what was the deal with that? So it's a, where I am specifically, it's a pretty small, tight knit school. Um, we're only about 100 students and I'm you know, really involved. It's almost kind of like a co- a communal school, like a fa- a, fa- a lot of close families and and communities. And you know, we all we go to the same synagogue, and um, you know, some lots of cousins and neighbors. So we're we're pretty. Uh, everyone knows I'm the Bitcoin rabbi. I mean, every person knows that. It's been you know a few years. They've all seen my book and talked to me. I uh, the adults and stuff. So they don't mind. I mean, I it's not like I'm. Uh, I wasn't uh, oh, taking off and saying you know we don't have to learn math this year. Uh, we're doing Bitcoin instead. Uh, but, you know, it kind of got sprinkled in and they, you know, everyone was happy with, uh, you know, I'm not like, uh, you know, pushing and I give out some Bitcoin to the kids. Uh, you know, we, we read some of my book, I do some of my presentation. So it was a, you know, kind of just got sprinkled in. Um, I had some, you know, classes about it and showed some videos, um, you know, had some, some more of the technical stuff. Um, but you know, it was a pretty, because we got our, when we get our math work done, you know, you can do some extracurricular things. And just generally speaking amongst, uh, the Jewish faith and Jewish people, how does Bitcoin fit in? Because I know there's some certain really, I'm so uneducated on this subject, but I know there's certain religions. So, for example, I know within Islam, there's like considerations whether Bitcoin is Islamic as well. Are there any considerations that have to be given with regards to money and therefore, or property and therefore Bitcoin fits into this? So I would say Bitcoin fits in from two aspects, one from a financial and also from a technological. So there's somewhat of a miss, uh, you know, you see somebody who's, uh, you know, where it's a, has a beard and hats and sometimes dresses in uh, like dated clothing from, you know, the 1800s. Sometimes you might see see that and they think, oh, these people don't, you must not use uh, electronics. There's a similar looking group in America called the Amish people people. Um, and I don't, you know, there might be others that, that are shy away from technology and that's not really the case in Judaism. There is, I would say a, a hesitancy as far as, um, media and social media, but that's about the content, not about the, um, about the technology itself. Um, so, you know, it, you'll find a, you know, a full embracement of, um, the use of, you know, whatever kind of technology, financial technology, um, you know, medical technology, um, just we don't use uh, electronics on the Sabbath, on Friday night to Saturday. So that's one side thing. Um, as far as the financial, the one main issue is about uh, interest, charging interest, usury. Um, so that's something that's similar in uh, Islam and, and Judaism. But mm. there's, I, I wouldn't say it's a, it, it's not even a big it's not a huge part of it. It's not really so relevant. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, if you are using Bitcoin, you know, there's a couple of questions that come up of when you're lending out Bitcoin, is it a currency? Is it a commodity? Is it, um, you know, is it the same thing as a gold coin? But the truth is those same questions were, came up as in Judaism when, when we went to fiat dollars as well. Is, is this money really worth anything? So they're kind of more, um, 
theoretical questions from a day-to-day application of can you use Bitcoin, can you save money in Bitcoin, it's not really a like it's not something that that you have to bitcoin is kosher that's what i say bitcoin in itself it's a technology if you use it for for kosher, for kosher things then it's kosher you know all technologies are just if you can use it for good or you can use it for bad you should choose to use it for good things and that's what you know that's what you do that's what i do that's what 99% of the people that use bitcoin do they just you know use it to try and be a store of value they try and use it to for for a means of exchange or what you know whatever it is to just live their life is it, is kosher a, used as a slang term broadly in the US like it is in the UK? Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is. Kosher yeah. does mean yeah. the, that food is uh, specifically a food is acceptable uh, for Jewish consumption, but kosher just means that it's good to go. It's it's all yeah, right. Yeah, good to go. Yeah, it's like if you uh, like if you're buying some tickets for a football match, you're like, are they kosher? It's like, yeah, yeah, they're fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yes. it's funny. Yeah. I didn't know that. It's just a less just like a Br- British thing. Okay, one last question in this area, because you mentioned the teaching of uh, Jewish law. How does how does that work in respect of the fact that, for example, if you're in the US, you have you know, state and federal law. Is Jewish law, uh, is it like a, a, a law that amongst Jewish people they agree as a way to treat each other. Like, what's the what's the deal there? Yeah, yeah. Law, Jewish law would, when I say that, primarily it means um, there are two. There's how you uh, interact with yourself and God, meaning your ritualistic yep. law. Like, are you allowed to like kosher? Kosher is a Jewish law. Are, is this food permissible for you? Now, there's no one forcing that on you. It's it's a. I mean, you know, with you you choose to be orthodox or not to be orthodox to observe this or not, but the these laws go back to the Torah, to the Talmud, to you know Jewish writings for for the past uh, three thousand years. Um, so that we learn about how uh, the holidays are observed, how Sabbath is observed, um, various things. There are some monetary laws that are you know how you should interact interpersonally with another person. I mean, even if the government allowed you to steal or you know what do something that we would consider immoral, you would still have the Jewish legal obligation. Um, so it doesn't really, it's not like superseding um, federal or state law. There's actually, that is part of Jewish law is that you have to um, follow your the, the local uh, ordinances. And, you know, when, when you're a citizen in a country, you need to uh, follow those laws as well. So, you know, part of that is, uh, you know, as far as Bitcoin to use it, you know, whatever, legally to pay your taxes, all of those things are, uh, are part of Jewish law that we have to, um, you know, be good citizens as well. I, I think Islam's uh, fairly similar in that you are also meant to follow uh, local laws as well. Uh, but but let me ask you, sorry, final question in this area, because I've never been to Israel and I would love to go. I think I'm, I'm, there's a smart chance I might be going this year if I can. Uh, is Jewish law therefore enshrined into Israeli law or is it still different? So not much. Um, Israel, Israel is a is a majority secular um, and most of the laws there are, so in England, believe it or not, England is a religious country, meaning the, mm-hmm. the rabbi of England, uh, is a, um, government position. The head of the, of different churches and mm. other religions is a, re- is a government position. And so if you want to have a Jewish wedding in, in, in the UK, it has to be according to the, um, rabbinate of, uh, you know, the head rabbi of England, which is according to the government of England. So that is similar in Israel. There is the, uh, if the head of the, uh, of Islam, the head of Christianity, the head of Judaism for religious affairs. But as far as the, the country as a whole, um, there are some, but it's primarily not. I mean, there's no law that says you have to, uh, follow Jewish law. You know, anyone okay, can okay. live there, and especially for a not for someone who is not Jewish. I mean, the the population of of Israel has uh, of citizens of Israel is is Jews, Muslims, Christians. Uh, every you know mm-hmm. every which religion in the in the world live in in Israel and can live and pray and worship and or not worship or anything they want. You know, it, it, people are allowed to to live the way that they choose to in Israel. It's a demo- you know it's a it's a secular liberal democracy. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely an area I am ignorant on. I don't know enough about. I don't understand enough about, and I should spend more time. And I probably, it's probably one of the things I'd love to just sit down and have dinner with you and talk about more because I have so many different questions. Uh, it, it, I'm really fascinated about 
fascinated by the the history of religion, multiple religions. So perhaps one day when I see you next, we'll sit down, we'll have a chat. All right, let's get back Absolutely. to the let's get back to that was a bit of a tangent. Let's get back to the topic of kids. Okay, so I mean the book's been out what is it three years, four years, uh, two two years, is it only two, two two thousand nineteen? Yeah, two thousand nineteen. So, okay. oh, I thought it came out before I'd met, what, like way before I'd met you. So what was what's been like your biggest? Well, we surprise? met we met in August of. We met in August of 2019, so it came yeah. out just a few months before then. It was only out for like six months. Oh. It's struggling to remember because the last 18 months have been so weird. But So what are, what are the things that surprised you most about the book in terms of having it released out there, having the feedback that you've received? Like, what has surprised you about it? I did not expect it to reach as many people. I never imagined that it would be translated into a language, you know, into other languages. I was hopeful that it would get, you know, when I published the book, I think I, you know, I had just been on Twitter uh, for maybe six months or something. I had never met a Bitcoiner in person. I had like a thousand followers on Twitter. So I didn't have an audience. I didn't have, you know, who, like who to share it with. I mean, I just had Bitcoin Twitter. Um, and that, so it kind of, I mean, it just, it, it propelled and, uh, I got, I'm, I'm amazed in how far it went and how far it took me, that it took me to California and it's, you know, taken me to, to different places to meet Bitcoiners and to get to have conversations like this. That was really part of the goal of it, or re- not the, the book, but part of my the goal of me being, you know, the Bitcoin rabbi and trying to be a, a public persona is to make these kind of connections, to be a bridge. Because some people, you know, you look at, you probably have seen, you know, Orthodox uh, Jews, you know, vis- visually uh, Orthodox Jews, and you don't have an opportunity to to talk to them, to ask these kind of questions before. Some people have never talked to a rabbi. And, uh, you know, wh- mm. whether a Jewish person or not, or, or someone who's not, or any other different religion. So I wanted to to have all of these connections. You know, I've, I've uh, chatted with of people of all, you know, from around the world of all different religions. Um, and they'll ask me questions like, you know, like, like we're having today. And so that I've just been so happy that the book has opened up that, uh, that world to me and that though, all of those different relationships that, uh, that I've been able to make it, you know, it's, it's been like a surprise and, and a, and a huge pleasure to, to be able to reach this because the Bitcoin community is so global and so diverse. And that's also, I want to mm-hmm. show that, you know, Bitcoin isn't just a bunch of, uh, tech nerds and finance bros, you know, it's, <laughs> there's all different types of people. There's, there's family people, there's religious people, there's, you know, all, all different types of people that Bitcoiners come and, and Bitcoin is really for everybody. Right. Okay. Well, let's start getting into the book because this is the interesting bit. This is a this is the this is like the juice of what you created. Um, you went to teach people about Bitcoin. You've said you wrote it in one session. Uh, tell me, tell me, tell me how you started. They're like, because you've got to be thinking here that there's a goal here. You're going to put this book in front of a, uh, you know, someone maybe five, six, all the way to what up, up to about maybe ten, twelve. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's really the, you know, it's the range. the range for the kids and then also, you know, for their adults. I've, the, the, it's teenagers in the middle are where they can kind of, you know, read, uh, if you can get them interested in anything, then you could probably get them interested in like, a a serious, uh, you know, adult Bitcoin book. Okay. So when you were approaching this, what was the goal? What did you want them to feel by the end of the book? What, what was the kind of, I don't know, what was your objective with it? Um, so, I mean, I write in the epilogue that, you know, I want people to understand what money is. And I think that children kind of know that inherently. I don't feel like it even teaches them that much that they wouldn't already understand. Um, the the qual- I mean, the the book explicitly goes through what are the good qualities of money, um, which, you know, as Bitcoiners, we're familiar with, but most pe- and most people in the world are familiar with at kind of like a gut level, at an instinctual level. You know why something is money and something isn't money. And then it's just for them to kind of look at, um, you know, fiat dollars and, uh, and, you know, people today think, some people think that the dollars are still backed by gold. Um, and, you know, they understood why gold was money. They understand why, you know, 
barter doesn't work. So that's really, I want people to understand what makes good money and why Bitcoin is that and can be that. Um, and that, you know, inflationary money is not something, it's not a, a granted, it's not a given that money has to be this way. Um, and it really shouldn't. And it's, it, it it's that way to benefit the people that are the ones with the printing press. Um, and so I think children who have a, a natural understanding of fairness can see the book and understand that there's something not fair about that. And there is uh, something fair about Bitcoin. Yeah, it, absolutely. I want you to explain, though, because there will be some people who haven't read the book. They should buy it. Go and buy the book, please, because it's brilliant, especially for your kids. But talk about how you explain the coincidence, coincidence of wants. So the the three children in the book are um, are uh, Alice, Bobby, and uh, Charlie, and who when every time you're describing a Bitcoin transla- transaction, it's Alice and Bob. So that's yeah, it's a a b c. You know, person A transacts to person B, uh, et cetera, and uh, they are. You know, they do household chores. So Alice sells lemonade and uh, Bobby uh, is a uh, lawn, you know, mows lawns and Charlie is a artist and he paints pictures. And these are all things that, you know, people want and people can trade with each other. But it trading it doesn't work because uh, all the time because uh, you have to have a lot of coincidences to make things to make everything match up. You have to be in the same place at the same time and want the same thing in the same amounts. Um, so all you know sometimes it works sometimes you can just meet your 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 pal and say you know oh i like your shoes oh i like your hat let's trade my shoes for your hat um but you can't build an economy that way um mm-hmm. you know and and so you can't build an economy where the person who is the chicken farmer always has to bring his chickens to the market and find the people that want chickens and and want exactly what they want you know there has to be some way that the chicken farmer and the shoemaker can trade with each other and they're not just only getting chickens and shoes. So those are the coincidences of wants. And that's why money had to be invented because there has to be this means of exchange, this medium of exchange that everybody agrees this is valuable. And just because it's a representation of all the other things, the money isn't really a a valuable to itself. I mean, gold can be valuable because it's jewelry, but that's not what makes it money. The fact that it's jewelry has nothing to do with the fact that it's money. What makes it good money is that it's good at keeping track of what people have. And that's how Bitcoin, I mean, people, for all the technologists who, who get Bitcoin and, and try and explain it and the blockchain and mining and, and, and private keys and pub keys and nodes and all this. I mean, when it comes down to it, Bitcoin is just a spreadsheet. Really? Yeah, Bitcoin a is a spreadsheet? Yeah, it's a ledger. It's my, it's my account. I mean, you know, whatever. For you, you and I both know there's more complexity to it, but it's my account and your account. My number says this, your number says that. I want to give you money. We just erase it over here and we change it there. That's and people can understand that and they don't need, you know, just like you don't understand how your phone works and you don't understand how Wi-Fi works and how computer chips and, and all this stuff. You don't need to to get into all that detail, not when you're talking to children and not when you're talking to 99% of the people in the world. Well, funny you should say that because I interviewed John Pfeffer, I think it was yesterday for, or was it, no, it was a Monday for The B Word, uh, the event that's being put on, which is going to include the Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk debate, which which I'm fascinated to watch, by the way. But um, he, my question to him was like, how did you discover Bitcoin? Because uh, he's a big investor and supporter of open source dev as well. And he said he was sat down by uh, Wences. And Wences just said to him, said, listen, money is a ledger. Bitcoin is the best ledger there is. And that's it. And yeah. He immediately like gripped to that. And he's like, and so the question is, well, why is it the best ledger? And you get into the details of the properties of money and how it works. But he said it's simply the best ledger that's ever existed. And and uh John was like, Well, if if it doesn't work, it's a it's a VC loss. But if this works, this is the best asymmetric bet I can make. Wences was one of the original people to to explain this well. I mean, in, I don't know, 2012, 13, he was on stage as I have seen his presentations where he explains the uh, very much, uh, you know, an influence on on the book of, you know, explaining the properties of money, explaining uh, the, you know, about barter and, 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 and it's not people, you know, say it's not like a development of first there was barter and then there was money or, or it, it's not necessarily about that. It's just explaining why. 
why barter couldn't work. Why do we need to invent this whole thing called money when nobody actually wants money? I mean, you can't eat Bitcoin. You can't sleep in Bitcoin. Same thing for gold. It's not like you actually want it for its own sake. It's just a ledger. It's just to keep track. And, uh, and and yeah, and it's fair, and it's fair because it's the best ledger because nobody's in charge of it, nobody can cheat it, nobody can print themselves more. Those are the the properties of it, and why that works and how that works, you know, is details. Well, nobody can cheat it. I mean, that's the principle of it. It's the best ledger, and nobody can cheat it. So, what about the properties? And kids of money? like I- that. Kids yeah, like the, something that can't be cheated. They like something yeah. that the, their principal can't cheat at, their friends can't cheat at. Nobody, you know that that. That's fair. And if you mm. do the right thing, you get the fair outcome. Kids like that. What about the properties of money? Because I first learned about the properties of money through VJ Boyer Party's The Bullish Case for Bitcoin. And even today, I was with my doctor and he was asking me about the Bitcoin thing. And I was like saying, well, it's the best money that ever existed. And, you know, it's better than gold because of, you know, talking about durability, scarcity, et cetera. But he kind of glazed over me with this. How did you approach the properties of money and why Bitcoin is the best? So all the kids, well, for everybody wants whatever they have to be the money, you know, the kid that yep. has that mows lawns, he's like, hey, lawn, I've got a lot of grass clippings. How about that? You know, the girl that makes lemonade, she's like, why well, can't lemonade? And we all know, you know, in our intuition, why those things can't be money, because they aren't durable, because they aren't divisible, because they can't be transported. You know, all of these things, houses are are valuable, they're useful, but you can't break a house in, in pieces, a bicycle, you can't all of these things, they just need to be used for what they're used for. Um, the money has to be something that you can, you know, carry around with you. Uh, you can break into small pieces. They have to be uniform so that they're all the same. That's why shells aren't good and and beads and even jewels, you know, precious jewels aren't uniform. They're all different sizes, different shapes, different colors. Um, all of these things are can be used as money. And, you know, if you don't have anything better, um, they can be. And that's what we've seen in, in uh, ancient civilizations. There were all of these things used as money, but they're not perfect or they're not good enough. And they might have been good enough when there was no alternative. They might be, you know, it's better to use uh, beads or or jewels or salt or something when, you know, the only, when you don't have an alternative, but when you have something can, that can be transported, uh, di- di- divisible, um, it's uh, uniform, it's uh, recognizable or verifiable, uh, all of these properties that we see with Bitcoin. And and frankly, fiat has a lot of those things as well. Fiat just has, you know, if d- the digital fiat, just it, the problems are that, uh, are the inflation and the um, permission of it, that you have to get permission to use it and that you can be censored and all, on all of those things. So, you know, for most people, if if the inflation is low and if you're not being censored, I mean, you know, when I'm going out and doing my day-to-day purchases, I'm mostly using fiat because it works for those things. The Bitcoin is what, when you're trying to uh, you know, hedge against inflation, or if you're trying to hedge against censorship or government control, that's what you need it for. You know, what? inflation is another funny one with the kids. I was, um, I've always seemed to have anecdotes for everything, but I was, um, I was watching a documentary on the BBC a couple of nights ago with my son, and it was about this group of mercenaries who were employed to go out to Colombia to assassinate Pablo Escobar. And I'm watching it with my son, and they're all like in this uh, hotel room getting paid. And they're talking about how much money they got paid, and uh, and it was uh, one guy was on a thousand pounds a day, another was on five thousand pound a month. And my my son was like, "It's not much money." And I was like, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, like this is a risky job, Dad. <laughs> they're going to call Pablo <laughs> Escobar's five thousand pound a month." I was like, "Yeah, but." Boy, this was back in the um, you know seventies, eighties. You've got to account for inflation. He's like, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, you know, you know how much this house is worth. My mum and dad's first house cost them two thousand uh, pound." So I basically went into a calculator with a rough estimate. I said, "Okay, so the guy getting five thousand pound a month, actually, he's getting about fifty thousand pound a month, and the guy getting a thousand pound a day, he's actually getting a few hundred thousand pound a month because of that, like based on today's money." And he's like. Oh, he was like, how is that? And it's like, well, that's inflation. Things get more expensive. And he's, why is that? Well, it's, look, there's a few reasons, like supply and demand drives it, but also just the expansion of the money. And that was like a real chance to explain it to him. 
I still think inflation, it, it, even sometimes with some adults, is a concept that you have to explain. I think some people think this is just a natural part of the economy. This is growth, right? It's not something that's a little bit more sinister. Yeah, I think um, Jeff Booth has been really uh, talking about this in his yeah, book awesome. that you know that really the natural state of things is deflation with tech, that as uh, things get more efficient and the economy gets more efficient, uh, then things should cost less. The reason that they cost more is because I mean is is w- because there is more um, there's more money in the system. That is now, I'm sure the economists can will explain 10 different reasons why it's other things and there are other uh, other factors. You know, good. They can they can explain it different ways, but it's it's pretty simple that if you print more dollars or pounds, which they are doing, and there's more of those and there's the same amount of goods, then the prices go up for that. And that's what happens in the book. The everybody's they're printing out money. The girl thinks that she she raises the price of of lemonade from a dollar to two dollars. She thinks she's doing great. And then all of a sudden, but everything else is costing more. The lemons cost more and the pictures cost more. And you're just you're at square one. You're the you you haven't gained anything. Um you might even lose out because your wages don't grow at the same rate, you know, is everyone getting uh, a 5% raise or 3% raise or whatever it is uh, per year for that? Uh, I think really inflation and the stories of it from when I was a child were pr- the, you know, they say like, when were you orange pi- orange pilled? And like from a child, uh, my dad would tell me, we would go to the movies and he would always say a movie was like $10 or something. And he'd say, when I was a kid, the movie cost 25 cents for a ticket. And when my father was a kid, so we're talking like the 40s or 50s or something, the the movie cost five cents for two tickets. So his mother would send him with two pennies and tell him to go find a rich kid who has three pennies so that they could get in together. And so, you know, <laughs> you look at what we're paying now, you know, for to go to the theaters, you know, I don't know, I haven't been in a long time, probably $20, 20 bucks probably, yeah. versus, versus two cents. I mean, that is, that's not natural. That's not, you know, that's not just because it's, we're all rich, you know, richer, which, you know, thank God we are. But again, that's because of technology and that's because of advancements, um, because of efficiencies in the market. The reason things cost more is just because there is, I mean, you look at the charts, especially this this year of how much money is being flooded into the system. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's what it is. And, and, and a child uh, and hopefully an adult, an adult might think that it's a lot more complicated and is than it is and they'll be told that there are experts that know what they're doing and can predict inflation but a child just knows that if you make more of something it's less valuable it's less precious um that you know it's it's not fair if you worked for something and then somebody else can just make it for free and give it out for free so mm. that's what happens with money well if you price with everything fiat. in bit if you price everything in bitcoin once every 4 years it appears to be getting cheaper. <laughs> well, that's why. So that's the that's the solution. Is that some of the kids were skeptical of Bitcoin, but the ones that uh, that switched over to the Bitcoin standard saw that their purchasing power was going up, and uh, that's you know essentially that's what all of the other things uh, that are that have to do with Bitcoin. It does you know have to do with uh, you know the number go up uh, meme that that is the primary the the limited supply which causes a price increase uh feedback loop uh is you know at the core of what you know what makes it a much superior money for the average person of of that they can you know put some put some savings can you know like you said you've got your savings accounts for kids i've got savings accounts for kids and i've got bitcoin accounts for kids um you know i've got some dollars put away cuz you never know you know when you might need a, mm-hmm. a few dollars here or there but also you know bitcoin and i put just as much into the to the bitcoin if not more than into the other accounts because i think that when they are you know when they're 18 and older and you know when they want to do that they're going to appreciate that Bitcoin savings account more than, you know, more than their dollar savings account. Dude, if I'd have done their $50 of Bitcoin a month in from birth, bear in mind once Charles 17, so I couldn't actually <laughs> have done that. But if, if I had, they'd be billionaires now. So, well, uh, start now. I mean, you know, the now. best time to buy Bitcoin was yesterday, but the second best time, you know, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what I say. 
man. I, no, it, I, I actually said to them, I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it soon to Bitcoin and you're going to have Bitcoin accounts because by the time they need to, well, especially my daughter, my son's slightly different. He's going to go traveling uh, at some point, but actually he might do it, not do it till after uni. So if I start now, yeah, I think I'm going to do it. Kids are the best each. hodlers also because yeah. kids, you know, when they're born or when they're, you know, a teenager or a preteen or something, when they don't actually have any expenses, real expenses, you know, they can save Bitcoin. I give out Bitcoin for bar bat mitzvahs, which are when uh, the kids are yeah. turning a teenager. And, you know, they're ne- you know, they're not going to touch that. They don't need it. They're, they're going to sit on that for, you know, maybe the next decade um, and – that's the ideal situation. That's that's at this point, while Bitcoin is you know going through fluctuations and it's volatile and you know all of this stuff. Just having a kid have the two benefits that they can see with Bitcoin is one, put putting away some Bitcoin in in a savings account for them, a Bitcoin vault or a multi sig or a savings or a paper wallet or whatever it is that they're not going to touch for ten years, and you can just keep adding a little bit to it and a little bit to it. And on the other side. If you're in a situation where they, you know, we're not quite there yet because we don't have a circular economy, but maybe we'll see this happen in El Salvador and maybe it can happen Mm -hmm. in, in, you know, small things where a kid who can't, doesn't have a bank account, doesn't have, you know, a, a credit or debit card or something, but does have a phone or does have an iPod or something and they can use Bitcoin, they can use, you know, Lightning Network and have that that $50 worth or something that they can have spending money and they don't have to carry around cash. And, and like, I, you know, I've heard you talk recently about your, you know, different cash and different uh, currencies that you have to have from country to country. You know, it, th- I have... Um, teenagers that, you know, you get a babysitter, you get teenagers to help out or, or clean up the synagogue or do something. And it's, they're the only people that I have to pay with cash because they can't, you know, they don't have all, they don't have cash up. They don't have Venmo. Mm -hmm. They don't have all these things. Bitcoin really can be a good solution for, you know, the pocket change. It's, it's hard to imagine that these kids, that everything is digital for them and, and they're getting devices, you know, younger and younger, hopefully, and that's its own question of what, when to get devices and how the devices should be, you know, how, what parents should do about, about, you know, good health with, uh, with having yeah. devices, but, you know, you can have a Bitcoin wallet and the parent can, can set it up for them and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and just deal with that. So I think it could be a, a good solution for kids and teenagers also. Well, I, I think I don't want to do it monthly at 50 pounds because I've got Shinobi ringing in my ear right now. And I'm thinking he's saying, Pete, UTXOs, consider UTXO <laughs> management. Come on, keep them, stop giving them $50 UTXOs. But look, okay, the other thing is, you, whilst your birth in Bitcoin is, you are actually trying to birth Bitcoin maximalists. How did you approach that? Because the other thing is, I've got all my, I was with one of my son's friends yesterday. Uh, my son got dropped off and he was there and he was saying, oh, Connor says you do the Bitcoin thing. He's like, I've got, Polkadot and Cardano and yada yada and this shit coin, that shit coin. I was just like, oh mate, we need to have a chat. But you're like birth in Bitcoin maxis as well with the book. That was so th- that the last chapter, chapter six, is uh you know, I've always been a Bitcoin maximalist. You know, some people say that you need to have gone through, uh, you know, the fire of of altcoins or, or anything, and that I never did. I, I the first time I heard of Litecoin, I thought it was a ridiculous idea. You know, I, I none none thing ever made sense to me. I tried to understand, you know, why anyone would need Ethereum. I still don't understand. The you know, I mean, there's some cool gambling aspects that that people like to do in it and they you know leverage trade and stuff not interesting for me doesn't if you that's i think that when you come at it from the monetary aspect um that's where which that's what i i came from i came from Mm -hmm. you know studying um austrian economics inflation the gold standard um no other monies no other coins as monies made sense to me um and uh that's just that's how I started off, and that's just how I've how I've been. I, nothing, no other projects that I've seen in the in the space have really interested me at all. And I don't both from a you know a, an ideological as well as a financial thing. I recommend people just stay away from them. You know, there it's like you don't you know you don't bet in. I mean, if you like betting in casinos, then then go ahead. But if if that's not what you're interested in, if you're interested in you know the next global reserve currency, uh, then you know Bitcoin is which that's what I'm interested in. But how did you explain it to kids? Like how oh, do you try so and get I, that across so, to them? So 
So, um, you know, I say that I, I show all the different coins. I mean, the main value of Bitcoin is that you can't print more of it. Yeah, and of altcoins are, everybody prints their own new altcoin. I mean, there's 20,000 of them. And that it's the exact opposite of the purpose of what makes Bitcoin valuable is that nobody's in charge of it. Nobody's printing more of it. Nobody's controlling it. And, and that you can, you know, you can run your own node. I even uh, allude to that. I say everybody's got the fo- the software on their phone. They don't need to trust anyone else. No other coins really have that um, have that aspect. So I say, you know, there's for the first, there's fed coin, uh, you know, that the, the government figure, the Fred, the fed, you know, tries to make his own coin. And then I say there's Bitcoin big and Bitcoin small and Bitcoin red and Bitcoin green. And, you know, all of these, which, uh, you know what, I don't remember the exact timing if this uh, was before or after your now infamous two Bitcoins uh, tweet. You know, when, I, when, when you said your, your, your pal was asking about if there's two, bi- why there are two Bitcoins on Coinbase. So I don't remember if I wrote this before or after that. But I, you know, I, I uh, backed you up on that. I said, you know, it's confusing. And I think that it's, it's confusing for people when they come into the space. And I think that it's important as someone who is knowledgeable to come out straight away and say, Bitcoin is the thing. Everything else is not worth your time and not, you know, not legitimate or you know doesn't doesn't live up to its promises all right last one lightning that's a difficult one to explain to people sometimes i think you actually approached it in a very very clever way thank you so well tell us <laughs> oh what wait what? Li- <laughs> oh, oh sorry i thought you were saying lightning round okay no lightning. no no lightning yes. how you approach <laughs> sorry, lightning? sorry sorry I misunderstood you. Lightning. <laughs> oh, so, I mean, a bare, uh, just a, a scratch. I think I gave it two lines. Mm. Uh, lightning, I mean, you know, again, who needs to understand Lightning? I mean, if you're running a node in this, I mean, you download the, the, the that P, some people complained and whined and said Bitcoin is too slow and doesn't work. You know, it's details. The, the, let the tech people figure that stuff out. Right now, I've got five different lightning wallets on my phone and I'm not man- managing channels and I'm not, you know, I- I'm not doing any of this back end stuff. So all the people, uh, you know, some people want to understand that some people want to have, you know, absolute full control and and you know are, are are involved in that and that's great and that the great thing about lightning is that you can do that um but it's you know the the details of it i just say there there are, there are some really smart kids that are working on making bitcoin faster and and cheaper and 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 all of that and and i've got a you know uh elizabeth stark and and lalu asatunkin uh there and uh they're you know they're shooting la- lightning beams back at each other so i mean that's that's basically how works i mean i understand at a pretty uh high level and thorough level how lightning works but i don't think that it's all that important for the average user for the people mm-hmm. in elzante how you know w- how this thing works or, or doesn't work or, or you know what all this is it's got to go into the background i don't understand how my router on my on my uh computer my modem and my router and my router makes connections to the internet because a good intelligent engineers were able to put that in the background and you know you appreciate that and you really uh, spell that out well as a UX designer um you know which I've always appreciated that perspective of yours that you know bitcoin has to be beautiful and elegant and simple to get people to use it in the best ways, uh, you know, the the most uh, self con- self sovereign and self controlled way. But different people are going to make different choices how mm-hmm. they're going to do it. So that's uh, lightning. Just gets a, a couple lines that you know. There's, there's some smart kids working on it, and that's a that's about you know the the main thing people need to know. And it's even more true now than it was then. I mean, so many people are working on lightning, mm-hmm. and it is worlds better now than it was two years ago. I posted a, p- a video. Um, uh, last week uh, that was from two years ago when I first set up Lightning on my computer. It took about a week. I needed uh, uh, I needed assistance. I had, was like, you know, had uh, video chats to help me get my notes set up and stuff. I was doing it on my desktop. I was able to to buy some stickers and, and it was just, you know, a, a mess, but I could see that that was just the first step. And now Lightning is is simple. It's, it's easy. So, you know, you can use it anywhere you can use it you know any any time it's 
it's really gotten far. And so I'm glad to see that what I talked about in the book, just like, you know, don't worry about it. It's, it's working has actually come to fruition and we're at a pretty good place now. Well, I just released a show today with Christian Decker and Carla, I forget her surname, Carla Cohen. I think she's got a double barrel surname, all about lightning attacks. And do you know what? It was one of those things where I was doing the show thinking, do you know what? No one actually really needs to know this. The question is, is lightning safe? It's like, yeah, we're figuring out all the attacks because basically these kids don't need to know it. All they want to do is they want to see a QR code, scan it and go done, paid. So I think you're right with that. All right, man, just to finish off, are you working on a follow-up? Great question. Um, I'm not really working on one now. I've, th- I've, I've brainstormed a few things. Like I said, I spent a lot of time help working on the translations, so that was a big project. Right. Um, I've thought of a few different directions to go with the follow-up, but nothing really, you know, this book, when I wrote it, I, it was like almost like inspiration. Like, it came to me. I, I, I'm really proud of it. I think that it gives a, a real overview, and I don't want to put something out that I don't feel as strongly about. Um, and also just this, you know, I, I, I'm the things that I'm involved in one, like I said, my, my t- Bitcoin is in my day job. So I'm, I've been teaching and doing all the, you know, all the, the other work that I do that I, that I have to do. And the main thing that I, that I do to help people is, you know, give these classes or do one-on-one talks with people that are just coming in and they need some technical help or they need some guidance. Um, and that's where I'm really, you know, spending, doing most of my Bitcoin work is in the Twitter. Twitter DMs or, you know, the other messenger groups, uh, you know, messenger apps of, of people reaching out to me. Um, I, I've gotten, you know, my my name has gotten out enough now that Jewish people, uh, you know, Orthodox Jewish people know where to come to 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 get their Bitcoin information. And, You're and the guy. that's been great. Yeah, that's the, you know, that's so I'm, I am working on those things, but it's mostly behind the scenes. So right now, Bitcoin money is is where it's at. I'm hoping to get a, a hardcover um, book out, you know, version of it. But, uh, I, you know, I'm, uh, it's been such a, a great book and, and and has reached uh so many people and it's still sailing you know it's still there's still people and the the more that it goes on the more bitcoiners there are you know mm. the more people are gonna need to read it so i'm hoping that it's like you know it's a classic and it will still have a you know a good shelf life i don't want to write something that's that's gonna you know just go and and be outdated that's if you get into two in the weeds and the technical also you find that you write something and then a year later it's it's not accurate anymore because that information is outdated the technology changes so mm. well that's listen, another look, idea the book's awesome I, I you know i'm gonna go dig it out because i haven't looked at it since i first read it with my daughter um i got this i don't know if did you ever see the photo i got this classic photo of me reading the book and my daughter reading master in bitcoin yeah, I I do remember seeing that. I've tr- I tried to find it. If you you should send that to me because I I haven't seen it in a while and I I couldn't I you know I, I you don't have your old tweets so uh but I I've I I love when people send me I've got probably maybe fifty or more um pictures of you know kids families reading it together and that's you know it's nice to have something i share this with my family i mean it really is the the whole thing like i said my wife helped me help me put the book together we worked on it with my kids they've you know we it bitcoin is a family affair by us and i i love to see it as a family affair cuz that's i bitcoin is for everybody but it's definitely for it's bitcoin is for families and bitcoin is for kids that that's for sure well, listen, I'll try and dig that photo out. I'll see if I can find it. Um, but just keep doing the work, man. Keep pushing it out there. It's a great book. I hope people are listening by it. I hope every cycle it keeps getting bored up. Uh, I think it's great. And it's great we finally done this. because like, This is so overdue. Not even just for the last few weeks with my back, but it's overdue. Uh, it's great work you're doing supporting kids in education. Uh, I love it, man. Hopefully we will get to see you in Austin. We'll catch up and we'll uh, talk Bitcoin and a few other things, man. Awesome. That's great. Right. Thanks, Peter. People, Thanks for having me. No, dude, listen, tell people where to find you and tell them where to get the book again. Okay. Um, so I'm at the Bitcoin Rabbi on Twitter. I'm there 24-6. I take off on Sabbath. So, uh, but, you know, my DMs are open. I love talking to people, you know, of all religions, all types, you know, whether it's a Bitcoin question or, you know, a question you'd want to ask a rabbi, that's what I'm there for. Um, 
I have my website's thebitcoinrabbi.com. The book is Bitcoin Money, A Tale of Bitville, Discovering Good Money. And it's on Amazon, really easy to find, or bitcoinmoneybook.com. You know, I one of the best things about uh, about Bitcoin and Bitcoin Twitter is the community. And so, you know, I reach out to me. I'm, I, I love talking to people. Love it, man. Listen, keep doing your thing. And I, fingers crossed, I'm going to see you in Austin in a few weeks, Ben. All right. Take care. Hello again, Violet. Hi. How are you? Good. So you're officially the youngest person to come on What Bitcoin Did. How do you feel about that? Pretty good. A little nervous, but feel good. You don't need to be. You don't need to be nervous. You just need to do what you did last time when you crushed it. <laughs> right. I'm going to hand over to you. Do you want to tell people how we met? So I was doing an exhibition in school, and I'm in grade five. And I was learning about cryptocurrency and how it affects kids and some effects it also has on the world and how it might affect the future. So I was researching and my teacher found you online and we got in contact and I asked you a couple of questions and I got some notes and some research and then I had my exhibition. So tell me how the exhibition went. It was good. We had um, quite a lot of audience. A lot of people enjoyed my stand. They were interested in how at a young age I was eager to learn about this topic. And yeah, so I think people really enjoyed it. Well, you certainly blew me away. I told you that. <laughs> I was uh, really impressed with the level of knowledge you developed uh, not just around cryptocurrency but also around how the economy works um, so tell me what you found out tell me what you learned about cryptocurrency so I'm not going to get into too much detail but um, I was learning about like printing money and the MMT um, we were also learning about that kids should probably be learning about money and taxes and like the basic stuff in lower like elementary and then learn more and develop more towards high school but just that teaching kids about money and how to use it and how to keep it safe at a young age is good so that they know for the future but do you feel like yourself that's right do you feel it's important because i know for example my daughter is the same age as you we talked about this they, they're they not being taught things like this. These are the kind of things that either I have to teach them or they learn about after they finish high school and go into university. I mean, they might do a little bit in senior school and if they study economics or business, but generally speaking, we don't teach uh, financial literacy. Um, so so it, is your belief that this should happen? Is this something that's going to happen in your school? Well, um, me and my partner for the exhibition were trying to work towards it. So some of our actions were to create a YOI topic or like a learning topic for kids for next year students in grade five so that they know about it. And then in middle school, we were trying to talk to the economics teachers to maybe come into the like classes in middle school to talk to them a little bit. All right. So tell me what you learned to Tell me what you learned about the money printer. Um, so, like, not too much about it. Just people print money because they either want more of it or don't think they have enough. But sometimes when you print too much money, it becomes worthless and it has no value anymore. And, yeah. We watched a really good video about what happened in Zimbabwe. And, mm -hmm. like, you told me you have the bill and it's like worth nothing anymore. Yeah, well, I went to Venezuela, and what happened in Venezuela was very similar to Zimbabwe. It went through a period of hyperinflation because if you print too much money, the money becomes worthless because there's too much money in supply. So because of that, I mean, this is an important issue for people involved in, I'm going to say Bitcoin rather than cryptocurrency because that's what my uh, podcast is about, but that's one of the things that people care about and why they buy Bitcoin. So did you spend much time looking at Bitcoin? 
Uh, most of it was Bitcoin, but I also looked at a bit of a wider range, not too much at it. Most of it was Bitcoin and like to try to see how it changes. I was trying to look for a pattern. It was pretty hard to understand like how it works. But once I looked at it for a while over time, it got a little simpler. Violet, I find it really hard to understand. You have to understand economics and technology and game theory, and I find it really complicated. Can you think of any of the things you learned about Bitcoin that you liked? Um, well, in school, one of our other actions were mining Bitcoin, and that was something I really enjoyed. Even though you didn't do much, you kind of just had the computer set up and it kind of mined for you. Um, it was really fun to actually do it because you felt like you were part, being part of something really big. So I found that really fun. And also I was talking to some teachers and asked them what they knew about Bitcoin. So that was pretty fun as well. So did you understand what the mining does, what it's for? <laughs> it's really hard to understand, but like, I know you mine part of it, like not the full thing, and then you get Satoshis, and then amount of Satoshis adds up to a full Bitcoin. So that's like the basic yeah. stuff. Yeah, so what, what the miners do is they secure the network. So they build the blocks, and they run this fast algorithm. And once they've found a solution to the block, it closes, and it batches up the transaction and they get the uh, Bitcoin rewards. It's called um, the, the mining reward. And they also then get the uh, fees for all the people who've put transactions into that block. Have you seen recently lots of people are talking about mining with regards to the environment? Like a little bit of it. Yeah. Well, so did you see what happened in El Salvador this week? No, I don't think so. So in El Salvador this week, the government passed a bill which made Bitcoin legal tender, an actual currency in the country, and everyone has to accept it. And they've also got volcanoes in El, in El Salvador, and they're going to be using the energy from the volcanoes to mine Bitcoin. <laughs> wow. What do you think of that? It's intense. It's intense. <laughs> Well, so one of the big issues with mining at the moment is it uses lots of energy and people have concerns yeah. for the environment. So lots of the Bitcoiners are looking for clean energy they can use. There's um, some people in Paraguay who are looking to use um, uh, the power from hydro dams. When we were mining in school, we had a computer, but I think it's called like GTA or something. And the amount you get is the faster it mines. So we didn't have a lot of that, but I saw somewhere it was affecting the environment. Not a lot, but... Yeah. Well, so, so all the specialist miners use a piece of equipment called an ASIC, and that's a machine to design specifically for mining. It's super fast, and, and, uh, and that can run the algorithm really quickly. So we say this thing in Bitcoin, stacking sats, which means you're collecting and building up your Bitcoin balance. Are you stacking sats, Violet? A little bit. A little bit. Are you getting your pocket money in? Are you get, or you call it allowance? Are you getting that in Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. And is your dad a Bitcoiner? Yes. He is a big time Bitcoiner, is he? Yeah, he was teaching me and helping me learn about it. Good man. Okay, so what's next for you with this? So I finished my exhibition, but. Um, Probably the next step would just to be learning about it in school, in middle and middle school, because I'm going to middle school next year, and probably just, you know, learning more about, well, not affecting kids, but how it could change in the future and see how it develops over time. Mm -hmm. And have you been telling your friends about Bitcoin? Yeah. In you fact, have? I think they? they're a little annoyed how much I know. <gasps> Well, it gives you an advantage to them. If you um, if you keep collecting your allowance between now and say when you're 18 in Bitcoin, you might have a good stack by then. <laughs> so you've got a head start on your friends. <laughs> <laughs> and did you look into other cryptocurrencies? Uh, I looked into Ethereum uh, and my dad talks about it. Um, I don't know if it's been doing so well because I don't keep up with it 
that much. But we looked a little bit into it and like the difference in price from Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then, yeah, that's basically it. Did you know there's these people called Bitcoin maximalists? <laughs> no. Yeah, so they're the people who only believe in Bitcoin. Oh. I thought you were saying, you know, that when we did the, and when I did the interview with you for the exhibition, that Bitcoin is one of the main topics you focus on, especially in this podcast. Yeah, it's pretty much the only one. So I'm considered a Bitcoin maximalist because I only care about Bitcoin. But I sometimes cover other things. I sometimes host debates. Okay, so is there anything else you wanted to ask me? Uh, have you enjoyed creating a podcast and talking about Bitcoin with some other people? I've loved it. I think it's the best job in the world, Violet. I get to travel the world. I mean, your country. Do you know I'm in your country at the moment? Uh, we're in South Korea, and it's no. But where are you from? Oh well, I'm from America. I was born in California, but I lived most of my life in South Korea. So I'm in New York right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've missed coming out here. Yeah, I love creating the podcast. I get to travel around the world and meet other Bitcoiners and talk about Bitcoin. It's uh, it's really good. I would recommend you go and research what's happening in El Salvador because it's okay. a really amazing project. But I, I just want to say thank you. I think everyone's going to appreciate the fact that we uh, got you on and I wish you the best and you have my contact details now and if you have any questions, you can always stay in touch. I'm very glad I got this opportunity. Oh, well, I'm very glad I got this opportunity as well, Violet. So thank you. <laughs>